back, everyone. You're watching We Heart Therapy, the special series EFT Talk. I'm your host, Dr. Annabelle Bugatti, aka Dr. Bell, licensed marriage and family therapist and certified EFT supervisor and therapist here in fabulous Las Vegas, Nevada. And I am super excited to welcome onto our show. We have Dr. Terry Murphy, and she's a licensed marriage and family therapist and an EFT trainer in Tennessee. And along with EFT trainer, Kenny Sanderfer, they co-direct the Tennessee Center for Emotionally Focused Therapy. And she is absolutely fabulous. She actually used to be a real bona fide rocket scientist. <laughs> and so she really brings those analytic skills to EFT, which, you know, a lot of our therapists struggle with, with the cognitive. It's like, yeah, we still want to understand intellectually even though it is an emotionally focused model. So she really helps us bridge the gap between the two, which is awesome. It's her superpower. And uh, we're just super excited to have Terry Murphy on our show. And today we are going to be talking about da -da -da, secure attachment. <laughs> now y'all might be thinking, okay, why are we talking about secure attachment? Well, it's important. It's the thing that we are working for and towards in emotionally focused therapy. I, I feel like it's sort of the thing we keep on the dashboard in front of us as we're driving, you know, from the beginning of therapy to the end, it's always in our front sight our, our front vision. And a lot of people don't really understand what secure attachment looks like. So Dr. Terry, thank you so much for being with us. And why don't you start us off with maybe like a definition of how we define secure attachment? Yeah, I'd love to. Uh, first, I just want to thank you so much, Annabelle, for having me on. Um, it's really an honor to get to be here and to participate with this amazing community. I mean, everywhere that I go, including your wonderful community in Las Vegas, it's just amazing. I'm so grateful just to get to learn alongside um, all of you. And thanks so much just for being such a great host and bringing these really important topics to all of us. I love to pop on a We Heart Therapy between sessions or if I'm particularly really focused and wanting to learn something like, oh, I want to really, you know, zoom in on withdrawers and how am I going to do this stage two kind of work? I love to be able to watch one of your, one of your videos too. So thanks so much, you know, for what you do for all of us as well. Absolutely. And we've been blessed to have you in our community too. You got to come and do externships and core skills. So we, we were very spoiled to have Terry. <laughs> I'm the spoiled one. It was so fun. Get yourselves out to Las Vegas. It's an amazing, really connected, very supportive community, which just really perfectly sets us up to talk about secure attachment together. So um, I love to look at our why. Why do we do what we do? So when I'm sitting down and prepping for a session, when I'm even really thinking about, you know, bringing on new clients, new couples, individuals, um, families that I want to be able to work with, when I'm really looking at a training, I think, why are we doing this? What's our why? What's our why in the whole process? What's my why for this session? What's my focus really going to be? And for me, uh, nerd that I am, I wanted to go back to the original source, you know, Sue's Sue Johnson's amazing, uh, prolific work in attachment theory and practice in particular, the language that I'm going to use. I have it right here is out of our attachment theory and practice book. Um, and then I already um, also pulled all the original bull beef, the 1969, 82 uh, version of attachment separation and loss. It's like three volumes and then a secure base. So that's just in case anybody wants to take a, a deep dive, like alongside us and just really nerd out and go read the source information. That's really what I'm pulling from in addition to um, Hazen and Shaver's adult love um, work and then Alan Shore. So um, anything that we're going to talk about, those are, uh, we're going to cite our sources. Those are the sources that we're, we're coming from. So um, what's our why? You set that up really well, Annabelle, when you're saying we really need to look at secure attachment, which is our end goal. The end goal of all of emotionally focused therapy, whether it's individuals, couples, or families, is really about the bond between people that helps us to feel really secure and safe, but ultimately results individually in a secure sense of self 
and that the world around me, the relationships that I'm in, I can trust. I feel secure in those as well. So we would call that positive working models of self and others. So that's the end goal that we're looking at. So it makes a lot of sense. We should know what that is. So when it's popping up in session, when we're working with blocks, we can really see, ah, I'm seeing little hints of either attachment security or blocks. What's getting in the way of us really being able to help our clients be able to have that. So what is it? Attachment security, we're going to define it like this. We're going to define it from the original Bowlby. And then um, also really looking at Mario Mikulencer's definitions in 2006, which are phenomenal. And he says there's really three components to attachment security. Number one, we need to have a target to which we can seek proximity when an attachment need comes online. So first, we have to have someone out in the world that if we send a signal, what we will call emotion, out into the world that we know that there is a bigger, stronger, wiser, kind other that will be able to respond. They will come when we call. The second component is that we have a safe haven in that bonded relationship with that attachment figure. And the safe haven is the sense of us. It's we, our bond. And then the third is the secure base. So once I've got the safe haven in place, and it does happen in that order, we need to be a we before we're an individual. And we can chat about that in just a second why that is. But once the safe haven is really established, I'm regulated. I know that I'm good. I know if I send a signal, someone will come. It starts to regulate me. And then I have the availability to do secure base. That portion of attachment security, which is not about the we. But it's when we separate from the we and I go out into the world and I face the things I'm going to face, I fail, I succeed, I do well, maybe I don't, I get into a kerfuffle with someone, we celebrate whatever it is that I know I can go into the world and I have a safe haven to come back home to that no matter what happens, I've not jeopardized the bond that I am safe to be myself and I'm safe to be with you. And if anything is off in either of those places, I know if I send a signal that you'll respond to me and that we'll figure this out together until it feels safe enough for me to go and do non-attachment related things in the world. So all that to say, three components, target for proximity seeking, safe haven, secure base. If you can say yes to all of those right here, right now with even one relationship, you can have attachment security at any point in your life, whether you were raised that way or not, which is the really good news, you know, because a lot of folks weren't raised with secure attachment and it's not, I think Mm -hmm. kind of the old school mentality was that, you know, if whatever your attachment style, you're kind of stuck with, but thanks to Sue Johnson's research, we know that there is plasticity, which means the ability to change whatever you started with, does it mean that that's what you're stuck with forever? And, you know, sometimes that can work in reverse. You may have been born, you know, brought into an environment of secure attachment, but then you have something very traumatic that redefines your attachment structure. And then, you know, it pivots into insecure attachment. And then good news is it can pivot back. And sure. I love to your point, Terry, also is, is about not being alone that the attachment science is very clear that the worst thing for our nervous system is to feel alone. Even if we are out in the world and we're facing, you know, something at work or, you know, a a kid on the playground, whatever it is that we face in the world, even as individuals, we need to know that we're not alone in our humanness, in, in our journey. And so Um, I really want to just quickly remind some folks a a few little attachment core essentials and again, as to why this is important is because our attachment structure dictates how we regulate emotions or don't regulate emotions and our behavior attached to it. So these things are inextricably tied. That's why for an EFT therapist and attachment specialist, it doesn't make sense to try to go in and just sort of change somebody's behavior and only address the behavior or, um, you know, sort of like put attachment relationships to the side, because again, we are not born alone, right? We, we didn't come into this world alone. And so we learn to see ourselves and others through our first relationships with other human beings, whether it's our 
our caregivers and then our peers. That affects how we see ourselves, how we learn to build our own self-esteem and all the attachment science tells us when we have secure attachment strategies, we are able to better regulate our emotions. It, and it's not just a having someone we can go to, it's that we also will seek them out. We seek out the older, wiser, safe other to help us. Our body, our nervous system was designed for co-regulation. And this is also why we don't go after just changing the thoughts because we know that's not how we're neurologically designed, that attachment. And again, that's also how we see ourself, our self-esteem and how we see others is wired through our fight or flight system, right? Our survival system and our body, our brain has attachment um, e equally on par with food, shelter, sleep. And so it's, it's something that we cannot live without. And Bolvi has fascinating research to show what happens to human beings, especially infants. That's where his early work centered on what happens to us physiologically and how we can die if we don't have attachment. And mm -hmm. so when we, when our senses input information that says we might not be okay, maybe we're being rejected. Maybe we're not going to be approved of, maybe this relationship isn't okay. Someone's not happy. Then our alarm bells kick on, on the inside. That's our, our brain lights up a danger signal. It also alerts the pain system and kicks on our nervous system, which is where emotions live. Emotions are just information that tell us about the meaning and quality of our current experience and our existence in life. And actually the prefrontal cortex of our brain floods with peptides and shuts down. So that's why we don't just go after the thoughts because our brain isn't neurologically designed to function in that way. We have to our body already prioritizes, solve the first problem of connection. If we can neutralize that threat of not being loved, not being accepted, this relationship being okay, then, then our brain turns off the alarm bells and all systems come back online. So even if we wanted to think our way through a problem, our brain doesn't have access to that because our body says, shut down all the other higher functions and rally it into the basic survival system. So we have all the energy we need to survive. So it's not to say that thoughts don't matter. It's just not our target of change because we're working with how the brain naturally works. And so we're, we're trying to create new muscle memories on that level so that there's more options available to your brain. So this is why we're so keen after secure attachment is because we know that that has, reaches every corner of our existence. Attachment is realistically the science about how we human. Yeah. So yeah. Said. Yeah. That's really beautifully said. I love how you're talking about the biological system. So we, as human beings are biological we send electrical impulses to regulate oxidation, our heart rates. You can literally pick up on the electrical impulses in your heart, your brain activity in an fMRI scan. It's not just image. And what you're talking about is not metaphor or hyperbole. It's literal wiring, the neural pathways, and not just our brains, but move throughout our entire bodies, the whole nervous system. And it is the priority exactly what you said, that it is so dangerous for us as human beings to be isolated, that we are highly tuned to be able to notice. And it's not the words people use necessarily. It could be, it's not any one specific thing, but we are wired to be able to pick up with our senses what's going on. And we don't even have to physically be touching each other you know, or be right next to each other, we're actually so efficient and so good at picking up on belonging versus rejection or abandonment or feeling slighted or hurt or even misunderstood. Any of those things can really trigger us depending on our lived experiences, how safe we feel in the world and how, how likely is it that I am able to reach to the person that maybe is misunderstanding me and correct like correct that signal reach and see if we can get back into that place of resonance, which then we both feel safe again, then our brain can calm down. Our prefrontal cortex is available to us again, depending on how much we can co-regulate, if we can take in that comfort, let that exactly what you said, deactivate 
our attachment system. It's exactly what it is. And you're right. We used to really think that uh, in that first 12 to 18 months, your attachment was set and whatever quadrant you fall into secure or the other three potential insecure categories that you just, it kind of sucks, man. Like hopefully you won the secure attachment privilege lottery and you just landed yourself in a system that had this knowledge and ability to send and receive clear emotional signals, to regulate one another, to comfort, to protect, to nurture, and to care, to defend so that there is both safety and warmth, but not everybody got to have that. And that's exactly what we found through EFP is we can actually utilize and leverage the incredible like nuclear power of an, and that's, that is a metaphor kind of, of a, of an attachment bond, which is the most primal sort of place that we are as humans and to work with the nervous system. So we are actually joining into the flow of how human beings are designed to be anyway. We're not working against or trying to teach skills to behave or think, or even feel differently. We actually just want to be with people in a way that starts to create enough safety. We are the temporary surrogate attachment figure, which means we are the ones that our clients are seeking proximity to initially. I don't know if y'all feel this way, but when we're working with highly escalated clients or couples, we really need to be the bigger, stronger, wiser, kind other in the room, the regulated other, the caregiver person that can reach for and lend our nervous system, our ability to regulate to the client until they are really able to start doing that with one another if there you know, is a dyad in the room. Um, and it really is us as we're really sitting and able to begin mirroring back with our clients too. So we end up creating a safe haven in the therapeutic experience in stage one so that we can leap into view of self, secure base, healing in stage two. So we are working alongside human development, you know, the way that we're born as infants in like, you're right. We said this to my daughter who at six years old, sat my husband and me down. I was like, you've done your best. You've parented the mess out of me, but I think I can take it from here. And we were like, no, you were not born in a condo across town. You were born in the family. We're going to, we're going to keep doing this. We're going to raise you this way because it isn't actually really good for us to be isolated and alone. We need each other. We need our bonds. We need our community, our tribe, our family, our people, our community to have our backs to support us. No one person is supposed to do everything. I actually think that we're really designed to live in community, you know, connected and bonded. Science backs that up. And there's a lot of great videos on YouTube, guys, if you look up the science about co-regulation, it's super important. And um, Terry, Dr. Terry, I'll have you talk about that in just a second. But I also want to remind people that we know an attachment that the more secure we are, the better able we're able to regulate our emotions, to be able to use behaviors, to express how we feel and what we need that are more healthy and constructive and productive and we're also more likely to be able to take safe risks in the world. Like if I feel good about me, then I'm more likely to try for a promotion at work that maybe I'm not sure I'm totally qualified for, but I'm not always going to hold myself back from opportunity. Does it mean that I go out like having no regard for relationships? That's not secure attachment either, you know, but it's, it's that balance. And Oh, interdependence and independence are two sides of the same coin and they actually foster each other. And so Terry, I'd love for you to talk about this because I'm just sort of channeling some of my clients who grew up where they didn't have families that taught them how to talk about emotions, that it was okay to talk yeah. about, you know, vulnerability or turn to each other, except if someone maybe was sick, that it was like suck it up buttercup, you know? And so you know, or maybe they had some trauma or things happen where they learn to sort of shut down that need, but they've, they've been moving through their whole life this way that they don't, it's like, well, I don't need attachment. Like, you know, and they don't realize it, it's not an, it's not an option. <laughs> it's already something and humans are never not in relationship, right? Even if it's the checker at the grocery store, our relationship may be checker and customer, but we're still having a relationship, you know, and, yeah, and that's right. intensity and degree, 
is variable, but we're never not in relationship. And, you know, we wouldn't get anywhere as a species without relationships. So can you talk about how the scientifically our body adapts when we don't have access to secure attachment? And what are the ways that this manifests? Yeah, I love that question. Um, It's very honoring too, isn't it? To our nervous systems. And this is what I love is we don't just have like the way our nervous system is supposed to be, or you just die, you know, or cease to exist. It's like, we have all of these other options before we hit failure to thrive. That description that you gave that bull, we did such a good job of bringing to all of the world's attention that we need more than shelter, food, water, and sleep that we, we need bonding at exactly the same level. In fact, you know, there's the, the little Reese's monkey study where with the felt mother or like the wire mother, the little infant monkeys would rather be held and not get food than to get food and not have that warm, soft place. Mm -hmm. We're really not any different, you know, as human beings. So this is the way we're designed. And I really love the way that Mickey Lentzer describes um, this alongside Alan Shore. So Alan Shore published in 2007, an amazing article. I'm happy to send the link if people are interested in um, reading it on interpersonal relational neurobiology. But the way that he talks about it is um, that we are born as human beings as a we, that there is no such thing as an infant. There's an infant and a caregiver, just like Winnicott said, you know, years ago. And um, one of the things that we know is for the first 12 to 18 months that a human infant is alive, there is no sort of differentiation between self and caregiver. It's we're hungry. We're afraid. We're scared. You know, we need to be held. We don't want to go over there. We want to do this, but there isn't really this sense of you and me. It's just we. And then 12 to 18 months later, we have what's called an intrapsychic birth where all of a sudden there is the separation and a distinction between caregiver and me. And all of a sudden, you know, the infant's like, no, I don't want to do what you want to do. This is what I want to do. Or why are you doing that? So there's, it's interesting because there's curiosity, but there's also a separation between those. And it's when the caregiver and infant have to learn a new dance. So it's not just sending and receiving signals about nurture and food and play and time, but it's also when I go away, how do you respond? Are you angry with me, caregiver? Do you punish me in some way? Do I have to be exactly like you for us to be okay? Or can we even be different when we come back together? Do we still have unity? And even do if you come when I call, do you, you only come, come sometimes when I call and it's random as- and my brain can establish a baseline as to what makes you come and what makes you not come? Right. So sometimes when the separation starts to happen, uh, parents send and receive the signals. We know that the threshold is around 30 to 33% of the time. If a signal is sent and an attuned response happens from caregiver, that kid has a pretty good chance of developing attachment security, depending on their culture, community, environment, race, ethnicity, gender, you know, all of the different pieces that come into play for developing a, a sense of self. Uh, We know that if for some reason that doesn't happen, either the percentages are lower than that, which means it's a little more inconsistent or it doesn't happen at all, or even it's dangerous. We know that, um, that the chance that that kid might have a little bit more difficulty around feeling pretty safe and secure with self, with other, or with both is much higher. And so this is what we know that happens. Our primary attachment system, the way that we're all universally wired as human beings, as mammals, to be is when an attachment need gets triggered at the same exact moment, we will experience attachment fear. It's almost like there's a realization in that moment that I need. And when I realize I need, I also know it's not a thing I can do on my own, which puts us in a very vulnerable position. And vulnerability is always frightening. It's realizing I don't have it on my own. I need your help. I need you to come. I want us to be an us right now I'm without, there's something I need, you know, out there. What strikes me too, is like that. It's, I think it's part of that differentiation of self, which happens, you know, just as our brain develops, it's like, oh, there's a me out here. Like I'm a person and I'm separated from you. Like we're different people, you know, 
which is fascinating. And then realizing, hey, you know, now that there is a me and a you and a we and an us, now that I know that I, I've figured out that I am dependent on you to help meet my needs, I become aware of the risk, that fear. When I ask for it, there's a potential it may not happen. And that's yeah. the fear. Exactly. Yes, exactly. I feel that now when you're saying it, you know, like that's so, it's just so accurate. Exactly. So the, the whole primary attachment system is exactly that there's an attachment need. We have that attachment fear. They always come up at the same time. And if we can just send a signal directly from that moment, a clear signal, the other comes, it's an attuned response and we can take in the comfort and the care, our attachment system deactivates. We move on about our day. And but attunement no, for you guys that don't know, it's it's like tuning in and being able to sort of sync up and get on the same page about what is needed, what what the distress signal is or the longing is. So it's it's an art form that's always evolving. But what matters most is the responsiveness that I'm willing to show up. I'm willing to try. I'm willing to tune in. I'm willing to learn you know, that lets us know, okay, you are here for me. When I think about when we're in trouble, our, our emotions emit the bat signal. That's the distress call. This is super corny. Okay. Here's my really dorky metaphor. So when we emit the bat signal, we have to meet it with a care bear stare, <laughs> which is like another uh, bat signal from the care bears comes out of their tummy. If y'all know your cartoon history, <laughs> then, you know, um, that, yeah, the bat signal is met with love. <laughs> I love a good Care Bear stare, 100%. I love texting that to friends in a moment of need. Um, Perfect. That's exactly right. It's basically you're sending a signal saying, I'm coming. I've got you. I see you. You matter to me. You know, I want to be the one that you reach to. And we know too, just a little side note, that it doesn't just help the person who's getting responded to, but the caregiver gets positive effects from being the one who gets to respond, being the attachment figure. And then also there's a co-regulatory effect in both directions too, when that co-regulation, it literally is co-regulation, just like you talk. About. Yes. And Everybody. some things that may like, so, you know, affect parents' ability to show up in comfort can also be their own temperament. If they weren't brought up with secure attachment, they may struggle with how to actually tolerate signals of distress as with like a a crying baby, a baby who has colic, where when we're in a higher state of distress, equally our, our level of need also increases, it's proportionate. And so if a parent wasn't taught secure attachment or never developed it, then they're also going to struggle to be able to tolerate the distress signals. They may move away, they may get frustrated, they may not respond. And then that just, and what you know, when people talk about like intergenerational trauma and that kind of stuff, this is where that kind of comes into play is that the thing that's being handed down is the way we were taught how to do emotions. And if no one showed up for me consistently and I couldn't tolerate emotions, then I often exit when, when your emotions get too much, too heavier or bigger for my own capacity. And then I send you the signal that no one's going to be there for you. You got to figure it out on your own. And then you repeat that cycle and on and on and on. (laughs) That's so true. It's like what gets really exciting about our work is when people engage, they heal, they're able to find this attachment security. It, it moves through generations. Like that to me is so exciting. You know, it's, it's amazing. And that's exactly right. So if that doesn't work, that signal response, I send a signal, you come, I'm comforted. It turns off, which by the way, no one can do that a hundred percent of the time. There is no such thing. It doesn't really exist that someone is a hundred percent perfectly attuned, available, responsive all the time. Because again, secure attachments, like 33 or less-ish percent responsiveness. We're not looking for 100. But what happens the other two-thirds of the time, even in a securely attached human, and definitely when it's less secure um, than what we just described, Then what happens is we engage in what we call a secondary attachment system. So when the primary doesn't work, that thing that we all universally have, we have plan B or C or D or E or F, which is a secondary strategy. And there's really only two options. We either hyperactivate, which is where the alarm gets dialed to the max and stays on. So now it's like 
maybe my attachment figure can't get it, but maybe it will go to someone. I'll even take like a stranger. And we have research that shows that even holding a stranger's hand, you know, in a moment of pain can reduce some of that neurological pain and threat. And there is a co-regulatory effect. It's still better for any answer to happen than none for us as humans. So that amping up the signal makes absolute perfect sense. Plus you want to make sure the signal's on. So if your caregiver happens to just maybe turn around, catch, be available for a moment, even they could catch that signal if it's big enough, loud enough, persistent enough. So the other hyperactivate and- as in, as adults, this, and I hate this word, but the, the street pop culture term may look like someone who's needy. And I oh, hate yeah. that term because we pathologize something that's completely normal. It's just, you know, it's like I may hoard attention, right? If, if uh, I don't have secure and I, my body says the only way to get it is I have to hyperactivate. I have to increase my signals. The, the emotion, again, behavior is the tangible manifestation of our emotion in our attachment frame. So if I learned, I have to make everything a really big deal and over dramatize things in order to get responsiveness. Guess what? You probably know adults like this out in the world. That's how they were raised, right? Cause they're their core experiences have said, if I just send a regular signal, it's not going to get responded to. So I have to do these things, right? Yeah. And really what's good. the other way, Miss Terry? Yeah, beautiful. The other option is deactivation. And so it is literally inhibiting the attachment signal. So it's not even that I'm sending a signal and then leaving before I get a response or blocking that response out, even though those can be components. But really... It's, it's the nervous system's way of going, I won't be able to manage this. No one's coming. And emotions are meant for two or more nervous systems to really work, right? So what's the point? It doesn't even matter. I get more confused. No one's coming anyway. I, none of this is really going to happen the way it's supposed to. So the it gets deactivated. The signal then is deactivated. And instead, there's this move towards more self-reliance and detachment, moving away from even anything that could potentially trigger. So a lot of times folks that um, deactivate in these moments actually look really calm and even keeled and emotionally regulated. That's not actually emotional regulation any more than the person who hyperactivates. Emotional regulation is actually what we talked about just a, a little bit earlier, which is actually being able to have an attachment need and fear triggered, to have an emotional signal sent, Then when someone comes and helps me regulate, I calm back down. So it's that big range and flexibility that actually really helps us to be well regulated, not activation. Emotion, feel it, not deny it and suppress it. Because what happens inside the body, right, is our body is releasing all these chemicals. We got cortisol, we got adrenaline. And so we know, again, so why we talk about co-regulation is because when we get a securely attached other, then it actually shows our brain releases other kinds of chemicals that counteract the stress hormones, the cortisol, the adrenaline. So we get vasopressin, which regulates pressure, stress. We get oxytocin, um, you know, all these really good, we can get dopamine and serotonin, all these really good things. But if we don't co-regulate, then guess what? Guess where all those things stay? So these people like have ulcers, they have heart conditions, you know, all kinds of, um, you know, physical, because everything that's emotional is also physical. So, um, yeah, so this is why we say, you know, it's not that we can't ever do things on our own. It's just, we weren't designed to live that way long-term for our excursions. Yeah. Yeah. What Bulby says, short excursions, short excursions away and then coming back. I mean, my niece was just here. She's just a little over one. And it was almost like an invisible force field. She'd run from my sister, get to a certain point and kind of be like, uh, turn around and make sure that we're still good. And then she could go and play. And actually, we just never outgrow that. We know now from the research, whether you're two or 102, we still have that wiring that is really the design. It's our optimal health, the way that we function most efficiently, conserves the most energy, which our brains are always looking to be able to do that. And we know that even your immune system heals better and more efficiently 
when you're in a securely attached relationship. And to your point, you know, from earlier, it really is a privilege. And so it's like one of the soapboxes I feel like I love to hop up on is I'm much more curious when someone is either in that more hyperactivated or deactivated place. It's not that person's fault. We're not looking for blame. We're more looking for the context of this person's story. So what is it? What happened? What happens for you? You know, um, you tell me you have no attachment needs. I'm going to start being kind of curious and wondering, I wonder if maybe there's some deactivation. So you're not getting good signals even to yourself, which would make perfect sense why that need isn't really popping into your awareness, you know, and then making it safe enough becoming more of a sur- surrogate attachment figure as a therapist to be able to say, that's okay. Let's just honor where you are now because the safer that you feel with you now, what signals do start to come? We just accept, give them space, take some pressure off, and then more and more access to you will become available to you over time, you know, which that's is a so- really beautiful thing. Yeah. It's so important because, you know, I'm thinking of clients and, and I've even had potential clients, you know, see these videos. I'm thinking, well, how do I know the difference? Like, do I have in, you know, my, do I have healthy interdependent, secure attachment or avoidance? And I would think based on exactly what you just said, if I deny my attachment needs, which basically means, do I deny that I'm a human being who has emotions that feels things that goes through issues that I could use comfort and soothing? Do I avoid letting myself lean on and rely on others to help me with my emotions and just try to do everything myself, then you probably have avoidant attachment, which is not the healthy kind of independence that we're going for. Yeah. I mean, and I was raised in the eighties, you know, all of Gen X, we were all, and I'm playing a little bit loose and generalizing here, but um, they really thought crying it out, us all kind of being latchkey kids, the the like serious independence we had from a young age was like a sign of independence. And we're a mess, you know, (laughs) like we're all now like, uh, I really want to be hugged and told that it's all going to be okay. It's like the stuff that we missed as innocent, you know, for the most part kiddos, it's not too late. It's never, ever too late for us to be curious about those places, to offer ourselves loving kindness in those places. And and as clinicians, to be able to invite people in. What I love about emotionally focused therapy is it really simplifies some pretty complex sounding things for us. Are you able to catch your own signal when something is distressing? And if not, let's just get curious about what that block is about. Okay, so you can feel the signal. Can you send it? I can access it, but can I express it? Do I have anybody to send it to? Do I have any attachment figures? You know, it's just reading research yesterday that around 12% of the American adult population has zero other people that they could turn to and share things with, which is a huge anxiety and depression are on the rise. And yet, despite all this science, why are we still wondering, you know, we keep trying to Our pop culture keeps trying to advocate for avoidant attachment, and yet there is a very clear correlation between the rise in avoidant attachment teachings and the level of anxiety and depression and aloneness and suicidality. These two are connected, and attachment science has always known this. Yeah, that's right. Oh, just completely... It breaks my heart. I, it makes me want to like get an old ice cream truck, but be like a freelance friend who just like gives out hugs and like helps people connect with each other. Yeah. I just can't stand the idea yeah. that there are people in the world who want to be connected and have a hard time with that. Anyway, again, and if, and so if people don't know how to human well, again, that is an attachment issue. And the, the goal isn't to just like scrap trying to relate to other humans. It's you know, let's try to be the best human we can and keep the search on till we can connect with other humans who are interested in working on being a good human together. So let's talk about some like practicality. So if I'm thinking of like, even when I think, I think it seems pretty clear to a lot of people when they come in as a couple, how that might be about, you know, relationship and such. Now there is a, a, a point in there where you have one person, usually the more the withdrawer who will deal with emotions by shutting down and, and going away. 
Yeah, that um, deactivating. Exactly. Yeah. That's right. And where they kind of feel like, well, I'm used to taking care of my own needs and doing it on my own. Why is that a threat to my relationship? Because your relationship needs vulnerability and your partner wants to be let into your emotional world to not be the only one seeking comfort and soothing and connection. And so it's sort of keeping them out of that and not allowing them to, you know, participate in their sacred duty in relationship to help you with your heart and how you feel you know, is we're not talking about problem solving. They they may not be able to manage the problem of your boss or, you know, a terrible coworker, but they can help you with how you feel about you. And if that can help alleviate the emotional stress you deal with on the inside, give your body the ability to conserve some energy and then have more to go out and face another day. That's what we're going to do. But I'm thinking of like, also individual clients who come in, you know, I've had people come in for career coaching and they're like, well, what does that have to do with attachment? And it goes back to our original thing. You know, if we have secure attachment, we're able to take risks in the world. You know, I have a lot of clients that never were able to sort of dream about what they wanted to do for a career because their childhood was focused on survival and they just had to do what they had to do to earn a check. And then they're completely unhappy and they don't know how to let themselves be happy because again, they might be disappointing mom or dad or, or someone else, you know, or, Maybe they're afraid to take risks or, you know, they're coming in feeling anxious and they they've cut themselves off from their family because their family's toxic, but they also have no social relationships. They're completely isolated and like, okay, clearly we know from the science, this is not okay. And I'm going to be curious, like you said, Terry, very curious. How is it that you came to not be building connections with those around you? How's it you came to be so isolated? Yeah. And you said something at the very, very beginning of super important, basically for the EFT therapist, prepping for session happens before session. And that's kind of what I hold again, coming back to the dashboard is like, I expect that everyone coming into my office is coming because they don't have secure attachment. That's why they're coming. People with secure attachment don't tend to show up to therapy. So, cause they don't need it. Right. Cause they know how to they, they're with the program, they know how to run it. <laughs> but, you know, so I, I already like assume, you know, and that keeps me out of judgment and pathology, like other models do, they tend to diagnose the symptoms of the problem as the problem, and yeah. not see the person's pain, their attachment structure underneath, they don't give that whole context. So, you know, it's really important to hold that, that what I see, I'm not going to just judge and leap to conclusions and say, well, you know, if you just would say this differently or do this differently or, you know, whatever, give them coaching, you know? So what would you add to that, Ms. Terry? Yeah, I love that. Yeah. Just like you're saying, um, I'm always curious about that. So like, let's say I'm working with an individual, not a couple, it makes a lot of sense with a couple relationship that usually someone who hyperactivates or what we would call pursuit, you know, in the behavioral description of all of that hyperactivating system and withdrawal Um, Those are sort of just terms that Bowlby initially, you know, talked about protesting, pursuit, deactivation, withdrawal. We call that cycle pursue withdraw. But even when we're working with individuals, every human being, no matter how securely attached you are in your primary attachment system, you will have a secondary system. It's like your backup parachute that you use just in case, just in case I can't reach for that person. Um, For instance, if like right now, you know, I don't know, something scary happened or whatever, and I would want to reach for my husband, but he's not here, then I would need a secondary strategy to tide me over until the primary attachment system can be used again. The secondary system pursuing and withdrawing is really only meant to get you back to the primary system, which is the only place we really get to co-regulate, get comfort, and the only place that we get to update those working models. So in an individual, I'm still curious about the same thing. So they still have a secondary way of dealing with things. And it usually it's that secondary way that we get caught in a secondary loop, even with ourselves, you know, so someone came in exactly like what you're talking about, maybe more of a deactivator. I don't have many needs. I learned early on. I didn't want to rely on other people. You know, I'm faster, more efficient, whatever it is to do things on my own. I would want to honor that. That's a strength. You're really good at secure base type 
operations that who I am is cool, good, you know, I can do things. I'm successful at work. I get promoted. I probably get very much honored and applauded for being able to shut down, deactivate, not have a lot of drama, not get dysregulated in front of people at work or wherever it is, or maybe even in um, public other things. At the same time, what's missing from the full human picture? And it would be the safe haven side of things. What happens when someone wants to be in closer proximity? Can we be curious about that part of attachment as well? Because that's universal. That's every human, no matter our story. So my curiosity would be, was it a relational wound, societal, cultural, gender, ethnicity, being othered, being marginalized, like what taught you that humans weren't so safe, either with who they are or with you, or maybe both, you know, let's just get a little curious about that. And then how can we find some flexibility? Because every human is more comfortable in either the safe haven end of things. We would say that's more pursuing or more comfortable in the secure base end of things. Like I tell my husband, I could wear them as a jacket. You know, I'm more on the pursuer side of things. I just want to like be like this, you know, like I wish half his face, you know, was in the screen (laughs) with me right now. And he feels much more comfortable on the secure base side of stuff, you know, like having his own hobbies and interest and music, that kind of stuff just comes very naturally. For me, it's more something I cultivate to help me to be more well-rounded. You know, I want to engage in more secure base type activities and know that I'm still loved and wanted and cared for. And just because I'm out of sight doesn't mean I'm out of mind or out of heart, that those attachments get internalized, that as adults, luckily we get to carry them around with us, you know, even if they've passed away, even if we're talking about like God or a higher power as an attachment figure, The beautiful thing is that we can attach, you know, even if it's somebody who's passed away, like my papa, you know, I still talk to him about things. God is an attachment figure, higher power, um, even imaginary figures. People have talked to Superman and other things, you know, imagined having some sort of responsiveness. And I just think it's profoundly beautiful and encouraging that we can attach and bond and heal um, in even those really diverse, even like existentially, the way that we think about existence, like all of that can help us to be even more secure. So yeah, even when we're working with individuals, it's still, you know, as Irvin Yalom says, it's the getting acquainted with the cast of characters in someone's mind, as well as, you know, the actual people in session with us that we're embedded socially. There's no, you know, limit to the number of attachment figures and people that we can be connected to and hopefully it can form like a net of safety and security in the world, you know, where we go so that we can take those risks, be creative, be exploratory to recover the parts of ourselves that we thought we needed to get rid of, you know, to be acceptable and loved, to go back and, you know, recover, reclaim those pieces too. It's just really exciting what we get to do, you know, as part of moving towards more security as human beings. And I love too, what you said when you're talking about you and Chris, you know, and it's really that balance, like part of what makes it secure so that when Chris, you know, does go away and engages in his own hobbies and stuff is that he comes back, he returns to the secure base. He doesn't just go away and stay away. He comes to you. He also communicates where you are in his heart, right? So that, you know, even when he goes away, I'm not out of his heart. I'm not out of his mind because he also communicates. We have that balance. And the more that, that the partner brings their heart forward, the less we have to worry about or wonder the more secure we can be. And the more secure we can be, the more relaxed we can be, the more we can let go and let our partner do their thing. We can go and do our thing because we don't have to worry about what's really happening in the heart of our partner. Yes. That two-way street. Yeah, that's so well said. It, it does. It feels just like that, like the calm place. Yeah, it's so true. That's really well described. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So if you're an EFT therapist, you know, we, we really want you to just hold this idea of secure attachment. Again, this is, this is the thing that we're aiming for from the beginning of therapy to the end of therapy. And hopefully we've painted a picture about what attachment security looks like. And, you know, it's a very wide expression of what it doesn't look like, but we do know 
but people without secure attachment aren't able to regulate their emotions really well, whether it's, it's like boiling hot running all over, you know, very messy and explosive to like overly contained in the denial and suppression of emotions. Those aren't secure attachment strategies. And we are talking about flexibility. Obviously there's a time and a place. If you're a soldier on the battlefield, you, you can't break down and cry over a fallen soldier right there where you have to be able to lock it up and move on for your own survival. But it's having that flexibility that we can return to that. We can process what's real. You know, again, emotions are just information that tell us about what's real, tell us about our quality and experience in the world. We let ourselves have that. And then we, you know, if we have secure attachment, we make good choices. We're not likely to fall into addiction, you know, or have affairs or, you know, and again, those are symptoms of, you know, those can be a thing we turn to when we don't have secure attachment, a way to try to mimic what secure attachment does for us if we're not able to get it in our relationship. So, um, you know, whether you've learned to sort of avoid and, and get away from needing people, or you feel like you, you need it, but you can't really find anyone that's on the same page, right? You know, or you're constantly worried, both avoidance and hyperactivity are both centered around the fear of losing it. They're just different ways of relating to it. It's one is I'm going to grab onto as much of it as I can, because I don't know when it's going away or when it's coming back again. And the other is like, well, it's better to not need it if you don't have it than it is to need it and not have it. So yeah. it, the problem is then people have trouble bringing it back online with intention. So uh, that's right. It's hard to get back to that primary because there is a protected part, it's less vulnerable to move over to that secondary system for good reason. If your person's not there, why would I be completely open and fully expose my heart? I would maybe with a stranger go, yeah, it's a hard day, but I'm not going to get into it with them. But maybe that would feel a little better than being completely isolated. But really, it's not going to have the same impact as like with an attachment figure of mine where I can really be vulnerable and open and then really get that deep, comforting response. What I love too is, and my clients have really taught me this, that it is every bit as vulnerable to receive comfort as it really is to send a signal of distress. They're equally just as vulnerable. It's so scary to need. You know, I don't know anybody who's like, I love being needy. I wish everyone would call me needy you know, or heartless or emotionless. I love it. You know, when people know I don't feel anything at all, nobody really wants that. I mean, it's funny. We joke, you know, it's in sitcoms and stuff, but it is for a reason. Mm -hmm. It's actually a pretty tough spot for us to be in. And a lot of us find ourselves there and kind of come to an awareness of being there and aren't quite sure how we got there and aren't quite sure how to get back because it happened before we were probably consciously aware of those things. So we just get to be a mirror. And as it's showing up in session, whatever it looks like, non-judgmental sort of reflection back, we get to just say, oh, this is what I see. Here's the pattern. Here's what's happening. Can you see it? How is that for you? And just to start to like tolerate being human more and more. Like that's what if you didn't have a responsive caregiver and you learn to deactivate, it's going to make sense why you might um, struggle to tolerate distress because nobody's ever been there for you. So there's this part of you that panics, says, I don't know how to be comfortable or okay or know what to do because no one ever did this for us. But, you know, we, we can get stuck in these places. And that's usually where people come into therapy. It's like, I, I don't know what I don't know, but I know what I'm doing isn't working. I don't know why it's not working. I just know that it's not, <laughs> and maybe I don't know another way. And that's mm-hmm. where we were, you know, and as a therapist, we may be the first, I kind of call us like, um, emotional and attachment rehabilitation therapist, because <clears throat> we may be the first safe human being that, that our client has ever encountered. And so we're rehabilitating their faith in humanity, basically showing them, Hey, look, not all human beings suck. (laughs) Someone can be there for you. Someone can help you with this. And then we want to help transfer that and extend that to the outside world, to relationships around you. And look, secure attachment is a game changer and secure attachment is not the same thing as feeling secure that your partner isn't going to cheat or end up in jail or doing drugs. That is not secure attachment (laughs) at all. (laughs) That's just 
security that the, the partner is not acting out or damaging the relationship, you know? But I would say secure attachment is actually pretty risky to your point to kind of like put a megaphone behind your voice and, and amplify what you just said, if that's all right with you. Awesome. It, that is exactly what it is. In fact, it's very risky actually to be vulnerable, to let someone know, actually, I do need you to the core of my being. I would not be okay without you. And isn't that Actually, though, the way that we're really designed to be, you know, what caregiver wouldn't feel that way about their kid? What romantic partner wouldn't feel that way about their romantic partner? What friend wouldn't feel that way about another friend? You know, this is real life. We need each other. It's not good for us to just operate in isolation. And it's not even neutral, exactly like what you said. There's a great cost you know, to shutting off our humanity, you know, to not be able to really just be with others and both. Because here's the thing, if you're not the needy one, everybody else around you is, you know what I mean? Like if you're not aware of that place, so like it's a two-way street too, which I hope really lands on all of us as encouraging that sometimes when I think, oh my gosh, I just feel so desperate. I feel so needy. I can't believe like how helpless I feel in this moment. Um, Kristen Neff talks about this, not EFT. She's a self-compassion researcher, but she says, you know, the common humanity sort of component of us is like, actually everyone feels this way. This is a universal feeling. Yes, you are needy. I'm needy. Bowlby says we're only as needy as our unmet needs. Mm -hmm. So when I experience someone who feels needy to me, it feels easier for me when it's them than me in all honesty to be like, oh, you just have an unmet need. You know, what do you need? You know, what are you feeling? How can we help with that? I would love to co-regulate. Can I put a blanket around you? Bring you some tea? You know, do you want to talk about it? Should I send you funny memes? What do you need? It's a little harder sometimes though. I feel like for us to really feel it and experience it and ourselves. Um, I'm much more comfortable in the caregiver, bigger, stronger, wiser, kind other position than in the needy curled in a ball. Like it's easier needy. for you to come to me and I'll be there to meet your needs, but I don't necessarily bring my own needs to the table and ask you to be there for those. And, and it is very much a, a two-way street in a, in a yeah. reciprocal relationship. And um, I, I love that you say that. And, you know, secure attachment is really a game changer. I mean, I think about you know, yeah, I've, I've always been the anxious pursuer in my relationships, but you know what? My husband lets me pursue him to the, you know, authenticity of myself. And he doesn't make me feel like I'm some crazy human being. Cause he also, you know, had some wounds in his life. And mm -hmm. so for him, all that love feels very nourishing for him. And so I don't feel like I'm this crazy person. Like, you know, I've dated some avoidant attachments, um, people with the avoidant attachment in my life who are like, you're crazy needy. Like that's not okay. And I didn't realize like, Hey, that avoidance was also not, I was like, why this feels normal. Like this is what we're supposed to do in relationships. Why is that wrong and bad? But I love needing my husband. He's my safe place. And doesn't mean that I don't know how to feel good on my own or go into the world, but it's because I feel safe that I know that I have a champion in my corner who loves me unconditionally. And because of that, I also treat him with respect and I don't want to do anything that would jeopardize or destroy, you know? So it's like, I just, I love that I can go to him and he's my safe place, you know? And that is incredibly awesome feeling when you've had a lot of relationships in the past that haven't been that way. Mm -hmm. So you know, that's what we're going to be helping you as clients. If you're, um, you know, someone who's seeking a therapist, you might be watching this is we're going to be just trying to understand you and how you human, like I said, attachment is a science about how we human. So, so we're, we're going to go the what and why, and we're not going to like go in guns blazing, throwing labels of, you know, you might be a narcissist or you might be this, or you might be that, you know, those things feel awful by the way, you know, and they really miss the context of, you know, the, the human underneath and, and how they were formed and whether you come in for career counseling or anxiety counseling or relationship counseling, whatever it is that you come to, you know, again, all things go back to how we human and, or how we struggle to deal with other humans who aren't humaning well. <laughs> uh, 
I know it's so, that's so good. We want you, everyone to just have the full access to everything that you are, all the secure base, all the safe haven, your attachment figures, so that you can feel so good about you just being you. I also find that people tend to find this secondary sort of benefit that they're more accepting of the other people being human around them too, which makes the whole world feel like a safer, more calm place. Not that things can't happen, but just generally the baseline sort of drops into what feels like a safer, more accepting place too. And who wouldn't want that sort of, you know, experience in their lives too? Just seems really like comforting and open. And that's so key, Terry, as you say that, even thinking like my own husband, when I share with him, how he just has this ability to help me feel good about me to help me know that I'm loved. You know, even when I've had like my, you know, hardest days or darkest moments, it's like knowing for him that he has the ability to help me that his love actually has an impact on me for the better actually helps him feel really good about himself, especially when he might've been at work and had a, you know, a bunch of adults not listening to him and, you know, challenging him every minute or, or being hurtful towards him. It's like, Ooh, at least I know when I come home, there's somebody that I win with and I can actually help them and I'm effective and it feels really good. And that just nurtures the relationship and builds our bond even stronger. Oh, it's so good. Yes, exactly. Perfectly said. Perfectly said. So we're going to round the corner. So we're just going to briefly summarize. Secure attachment is the ability to effectively own the fact that you have emotions, not deny them or just let them run all over the place. We're able to own that we have emotions. We're able to get curious, understand what's about them. And we are for the majority of the time, able to seek productive, healthy, constructive ways of expressing those, getting what we need. We feel comfortable leaning on and relying on our older, our safer other, our secure base, our safe haven. We don't avoid going to them. We, we do seek them out and allow ourselves to be comforted by them. And and because of that, it helps us feel good about ourselves, and we're able to take safe risks in the world, not ones that destroy relationships or jeopardize our life, but, you know, we're able to try, you know, like we said, try for that job promotion or, you know, maybe invite the gal across the hall to coffee or, you know, whatever, you know, we're able to take those safe risks and, you know, we tend to make good, healthy choices. And if, if you're struggling with that, again, don't, don't think that you're a bad human being, especially if you feel bad, that just means that you're actually a good human being because bad human beings, in fact, don't feel bad when they hurt other people. But, you know, there is a place for you. Hopefully what you've heard today is, you know, that maybe EFT might be for you that we're going to look at your whole context. We're going to look at you as the person and not just see the behavior or the emotions and just start labeling you and tell you to go get anger management or, you know, maybe go see a psychiatrist, take some pills, <laughs> you know, let's medicate the humanity out of you, <laughs> you know, no, we're going to teach you. We're going to help you understand you, the core of you, how you were built, why you were built the way that you were, what it is that you want to do and have and be in the world and help you do that without needing drugs. I mean, some cases medication can be helpful, but it's, it's not always necessary, but we're going to help you be the best you and be able to have the kinds of relationships you want to have and, and have the kind of life that you want to have in healthy ways. <laughs> That's so beautifully said. Yes. We just want to be human with you, walk alongside you. I always love to use Lord of the Rings references. If you're not into Lord of the Rings, like quick dissociate or you know, think about groceries, but I always think like our clients are like, Frodo and we get to be Samwise and they're like, yes, I'm going to go alone. And we're like, yes, and we're going to go with you, you know? So yes, you're going to face it alone, but it's like, you have the support of someone who really wants you to be all that you can possibly really be the highest sort of you, you know, and uh, to support you along the way to get there. And I love that this community, our, you know, EFT community is supportive of one another, as well too. So hopefully it feels like a really soft place to land, whether you're a clinician or a client or just curious about attachment security, that this can be a comforting place, you know, a safe place to be too, as secure as possible. 
where we can take some risks, you know, create and explore together too. That's awesome. I love that. I always think of like putting on my Indiana Jones hat. We're going to be yeah. <laughs> exploring together. It's an adventure. Adventure. Exactly. Find good things. Hidden buried treasure is what we're going to find. <laughs> yes. Yes, exactly. That's just right. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Terry, for being on our show today. Now, so if folks want to find you. So you're, you're in Tennessee. You're yes. in a suburb of Nashville. You do intensives with couples. You're also an EFT trainer. So let's just say if folks, let's, let's start with the therapist. If they want to bring you to their community to have you do a training for them, or they want to come to one of your trainings, how do they find you? Perfect. Uh, my website is just terrymurphy.com. Got all of my trainings listed there. My admin assistance email is there. You can just reach out, send us an email. Um, she is on top of it. Unlike me, she knows where she is in space and time at any moment, which is sounds like a miracle. Um, I am not of the lucky human variety that can embody time and space. Uh, that's just not one of the gifts that got downloaded to me, but she knows it and knows my schedule. Um, if it is um, something that you're uh, wanting to do training, speaking events, you know, any of that stuff, she's got that on lock. Um, if it's a client um, curious about openings, uh, my weekly schedule um, is full a good bit of the time. Occasionally there are openings. Just go ahead and send us an email. That's terrymurphycounseling.com. And then if you are in the area or you want to know more about our trainings that we do specifically through EFT Tennessee, so like ICEFT official trainings, then that is EFT Tennessee. Dot com And that will have my trainings and also uh, my co-director, Kenny Sandifer, who's also a trainer. It'll have all of his events um, there too. So you can even find any of us um, in Tennessee. If you're curious about how you'd like to join up um, with those sure. things too. And Dr. Terry and her husband, Chris, had a fabulous video series that's still available on Facebook. Um, it's the come together morning show and it is absolutely brilliant. And, um, Terry and her husband are just two of my absolute favorite people <laughs> them all day long because they're, they're just so cool to listen to. So if you uh, probably type in the Facebook, uh, videos, search bar, uh, come together morning show, you'll find it. And they're really amazing. So make sure you check those out too. And I will list all of um, Terry's websites and her email in the description for this video if you're watching it on YouTube um, so that you can just easy click and have your way to access her. If you're listening um, wherever you listen to podcasts, you might have to rewind and take a note and write it down. <laughs> so or you could Google Terry Murphy EFT Tennessee um, if you want to book her a couples intensive or a training with her. And you can also come out to Las Vegas. I do couples intensives as well. You could attend an EFT training out here. My podcast now, We Heart Therapy, offers retreats and um, workshops for therapists and soon couples. And um, you know, you can always uh, subscribe. And I uh, wrote an EFT book using relentless empathy in the therapeutic relationship. You can just look on Amazon. Annabel Bugatti, Relentless Empathy, and it'll pull it up. So it was endorsed by Sue Johnson, which is pretty cool. It's for therapists, but I've had a lot of people in the public, like some doctors and nurses, anyone who works with, with the general public, they've gotten a lot of good, a lot of good. good but, so but thank you again, Terry, so much for being on our show. We're absolutely going to have her back and she's going to talk to us about more of her amazing wisdom and attachment. And we hope that you like what you hear today. And to catch Terry on a future episode or any of the past episodes, make sure that you hit subscribe because more videos are on the way. Don't forget to buy my book, Using Relentless Empathy in the Therapeutic Relationship, Connecting with Challenging and Resistant Clients for Helping Professionals, available on Amazon or on my website, www.drbugatti.com.